I've been wanting to make the moon. I've been making spheres by putting pieces together to make regular solids. I've done a few spheres this way where I glue together 12 pentagons to make a dodecahedron. Then I carve away everything that's not a sphere with the CNC machine and the lathe. What I'd like to do with this moon project is to make the 12 pentagons with the surface of the moon already carved into them when I put them together to form the sphere. What I need to figure out in doing this is how do I make these 12 pentagons? So there are two ideas that I want to work with. The simple idea is that you can take a grayscale height map image. You can use that to build a three-dimensional model with a surface. And it works really well for terrains and landscapes. The other idea is a little more complicated, but it's the idea that a map of a sphere is very similar to a spherical environment map, which you use to make these panable environments that you see on Google Maps and also in video games. It was done in the past, and I'm not sure if this is how it's still done, but you make a skybox around a video game, which is a big cube that you're inside of, and the background image of the environment that you're in is mapped onto that cube. I figured out how to map a spherical environment onto a box. And this method is used to make the skybox for a video game. But I was thinking, why not map a map onto an object, like a cube? So I can use this to map the surface of the moon onto a cube. And why even stop at a cube? I could map the surface of the moon onto a dodecahedron. So once I had the surface of the moon mapped onto a dodecahedron, I could then save out each of the 12 pentagons with the right patch of height map for the moon. Then I modeled a section of a sphere to map that height map onto. And that gave me the bumpy surface of the moon as well as the curve of the sphere of the moon. I then set it up in Blender where I could just swap out each of the 12 height map images onto that section of sphere and get all 12 of the models that I needed. The first thing I did in the shop was to make two test pieces. And I tested one cutout out of sequoia wood, which I have a bunch of that I cut up a few years ago. And it's nice because it's really soft and it's good for prototyping, this kind of stuff. This test I made a little bit bigger than I ended up with. I think it's seven inches from one of the sides to the point on the other side. With this one, I did a roughing pass with a half inch bit, and then a sort of in-between roughing pass, finishing pass with a quarter inch bit, and then a final finishing pass with an eighth inch bit. And this took quite a while, as it was also a little bit bigger. And the surface was fairly good, but it was still a little bit fuzzy. I cut out the piece with a half inch bit. And I used large bridges, so using the chisel didn't really work. I ended up using the jigsaw to cut the piece free. And I cleaned it up a little bit. And the surface was fairly good, just a little bit fuzzy. But really my intent here was to see if I could cut the piece out and it would work and it would look something like what I thought it was going to look like. <laughs> The second piece that I tested was birch plywood. I made the piece a little smaller. I think this is five inches from a flat side to the point on the Pentagon. And with this one, I just did a 
roughing pass with a quarter inch bit and then a finishing pass with the eight inch bit. The birch plywood came out really fuzzy on the surface. Like it just didn't cut it very well. I had hoped I would see more contouring within the plywood on the piece. It really just looked like it was out of a piece of birch <laughs> that was fuzzy. So I decided I wouldn't do the birch plywood, even though that's what I had thought I would use. In thinking about it, the contouring that I wanted would really only work if the plywood layers themselves had the curve of the sphere built into them, which they don't. So the contouring really wouldn't work even if you could see it. Four forward, drift into the right a little. Down a half. On back right. Okay, engine stop. So I felt like I was ready to just start doing the project at this point. So I found a piece of poplar that I had bought a while ago. I picked this up, I think, just sort of as extra to use for blocking or just extra pieces that I might need. But it doesn't have very much grain to it, and it's fairly solid, continuous wood, so I thought it would work well for the pieces of the moon. I jointed it and planed it and got it to about the right length. I took it over to the CNC, and as I always do, I, I think I'm ready to start. And I remembered I needed to hold this down to the table. I cut dados into the two ends, just so I'd have a place for my hold downs. I say it every time. <laughs> Holding the workpiece on the table is just as important as all the work of moving the spindle around. So I had the 12 parts that I was gonna cut out all in a line so they would fit on a long, straight piece of wood. My CNC computer is getting a little bit on the old side, so I was really only able to do one at a time. And that was fine, as once I got into the rhythm of making each one, it went fairly quickly. It was mostly just waiting for it to do all the cutting. I was using an upcutting bit, so the edges on the top were a little fuzzy. All of that's going to get cut away, anyways. Listen, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. I noticed on the Pentagons that one of the sides didn't have the fuzzy edge, so I decided to make my finishing pass parallel to that edge hoping that my finishing pass would be cleaner, cutting it in that direction. But it really wasn't. <laughs> in fact, it seemed worse. In thinking about it, because I was using an upcutting bit to do the roughing pass, the edge at the top isn't like the cut at the bottom. It's a, it's a whole different way of cutting the wood. I went back to going back and forth across the piece, and that also didn't seem very good. Then I remembered I could do other kinds of patterns in the finishing pass, and I found you could do a spiral cut. And what that meant is I didn't have to go back and forth across the cut. So I could do everything as a climbing cut, instead of going from a climbing cut to a conventional cut to a climbing cut to a conventional cut. And that left a much nicer surface. Not as much of the, the fuzzy bits. <laughs> so this is what the pass looks like in Mach 4. So I could do all 12 of these this way. It was kind of fun watching it kind of make the moon surface kind of appear into the piece. My little eighth inch bit stayed sharp during all of them, so that, that worked pretty well. I think I got the, the feeds and speeds about right. I think I was doing 80 inches a minute at 17,000 RPM. I think that's what I ended up at. Then I could cut the pieces out, and I needed the length of a half-inch bit to, to go deep enough. So this is where I started to think about how they were going to go together to form the sphere. And what I was beginning to see was that the way my jig on the table saw is set up for cutting the angles between these pieces, I need a straight, flat edge all the way around the pentagon. And if I cut the angle into the curved, into the curved surface, I'm not going to have that straight, flat edge. I'm going to have sort of an arc shape with a bunch of wigglies in it. <laughs> so for this 
test of the project. I'm going to cut out the surface at one level and then go a little bit deeper and cut out the whole piece from the larger piece of wood. So I'll end up with a, a straight line along that edge. And you'll see this more when I cut these on the table saw. But what this means is the seam between the 12 pentagons is going to be a little bigger than I really had hoped. I've been thinking about a method for doing this project where I don't use the edge to place the pentagons on the table saw jig. I think a plug, sort of a mortise and tenon on the underside of the pentagon that's also a pentagon that holds the pentagon in place without touching the edges, but I haven't gotten that far yet. And this surface looks much better than my two test pieces. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. I can take the piece off the CNC finally. I went to start cutting the pieces free and I cut two off and then remembered I really wanted to label these as I had them all numbered in the computer so I knew which one was which. Trying to figure out how the puzzle went back together again would be not impossible, but difficult. <laughs> and I sanded off as much as I could of the leftover ledge where I was holding these pieces in a piece of wood and I can take the rest of it off with my shaper. I couldn't lower the shaper bit quite enough to get the bearing low enough. So I added a scrap piece of wood with a hole in it so I could put the bit at the right height. So I could run the bit along the edge and take off the last bit of wood that I cut through on the bandsaw. And this will give me an edge to put against on the table saw jig. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. The lamb foot beds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches. I took some clamps that I had from the pan router. I can't figure out quite what the mechanism is, but it allows you to have things that have a little bit of variability in the height when you clamp them down, which is exactly what I needed for these pieces with their somewhat random surface. You can see as I cut these, I'm left with a sort of a straight line across the edge that I can use to hold against the fence and the table saw. This is an extra piece, and I cut it a little further into the surface, so you, you can see what happens when I cut that edge off, and I try and make the seam go away, and how that arc along the surface of the moon doesn't lie flat against the fence on the table saw jig. And it would be a random distance to the blade if I did it that way. So I need to figure out a way to hold these from the inside of the underside of the surface. The next problem I had is I had figured I would just use my pin clamps to hold this together as I glued the pieces together, not realizing that the arc of the sphere is already cut into the outer surface, so there's nothing for the pins to hold on to. So this really wasn't going to work. And I stood around and tried to figure out how I was going to do this. One thought was to make a little bracket on the inside that would hold the pieces together. One thought was to just hold three together by hand for 10 minutes while the glue dried. Another thought was to just use CA glue and have a second person put the hardener in just so the glue would dry faster. Then my wife actually suggested, and it ended up working perfectly, was to use biscuits on the edges of each of the pieces. I could use the back of each piece as a reference and put a number zero biscuit into each side. And this actually worked well enough that I could put the piece together without any glue. And in fact, I'm kind of thinking now I won't glue it just yet, as I may still want to look at this and experiment with it. 
but I can see that it works and I've gotten all the way through to the end. It's just a matter of figuring out how to make the seams a little smaller between the pieces. It actually worked really well. I can even see beyond just the seams being big that the curve of the sphere is very close, but if the cuts were a little closer to the center of each pentagon, making the pentagon smaller with the same curve and the same model, I think the sphere would be even closer to a sphere. I think right now the bulges or sort of the, the curve of each pentagon is a little bit too tight. And I think that's because the seam is too wide. I definitely want to do more of these. If you want to look back, you can look at the full video of the dodecahedron spheres I made a little while back. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Thanks for watching.